This is an introduction to Git, even for non-developers. Um, hi, I'm John. Hi. Um, I'm known online, most places, as GeneHack. Um, if, uh, particularly with Twitter and GitHub, I'm GeneHack. If you want to like, tweet about this talk, make sure to tag me so I know the stuff that you're saying that I did bad. Um, when I'm not at conferences in my day job, I am the vice president of technology at a company called Infinity Interactive. We're a custom software development and technology consultancy. Um, but I also do a lot of open source work and I, I do some speaking. Um, so let's start out with a quick audience survey. How many of you identify as a non-developer? Show of hands. Okay, so maybe half the room. How many of you identify as a developer? Uh, again, about half the room. How many of you are like somewhere in between? Like you don't want to... And again, about half the room, that's awesome. Um, <laughs> how many people have no experience at all with Git? All right, so again, maybe like a third of the room. How many people have some experience? About two thirds of the room. How many of you consider yourself a Git expert? No hands, awesome. Um, so for those of you with some Git experience, how many of you are anxious about using Git? Like you feel like when you're using Git, you're gonna screw something up. Most of the people who said they have some experience with Git. All right, so my goals for this talk are to somewhat simplify and demystify Git. Um, open source, in general, really desperately needs contributions from non-developer type people, um, but Git anxiety can slow down or block otherwise helpful contributions. So I'd like to help people understand Git a little bit better, work to reduce that barrier of entry, and maybe get some more open source contributions from those non-developer type people. So I'm gonna talk about how you obtain a Git repository to work on, talk about adding files to that repository, changing files in that repository, sending those changes back up to the original source that you got the repository from, uh, branching and merging, and also a little bit about how you can save your bacon when things go pear-shaped, um, and then finish up with some additional resources to follow up on later. Um, so ground rules for this talk. This is a really difficult topic, right? We've already established that most of the people who are, have some experience with Git have a lot of anxiety around using Git. So I'm gonna try to explain things in somewhat different terms than people normally use when they're talking about Git, and I'm gonna try really hard to avoid saying things like just, simple, and easy. <laughs> um, if I screw up, which I probably will, um, please feel free to call me out because there's really nothing about this that is just simple or easy. Um, so what is Git? If you go out on the internet and try to determine what is Git, you will learn that Git is a distributed revision control system. Uh, this definition has the unique combination of being 100% accurate and also being completely useless unless you already know what these words mean. So if you don't already know what it means, you might react a little bit like this. It's a little bit too dark to see. That's my dog looking perplexed. Um, so let's break this down. So let's start with the second half, revision control system. What is a revision control system? A revision control system is just track changes. Who's used track changes, like in Word or Google Docs? You're all lying, put your hands up. Um, revision control system is just a fancy way of saying track changes. Um, and you may be familiar with some other revision control systems, RCS, uh, CBS, SBN, uh, Microsoft's uh, Team Foundation system, Get They're a fundamental building block of software development. Brief aside, uh, since I have your attention, how many of you are students? Maybe a quarter of the room. How many of you are teachers? Few people. All right. If you are a student, you should be getting taught this shit in school. Right? If you are a teacher, you should, like, particularly if you are in any kind of uh, computer science or IT or MIS or whatever you call it, curriculum, revision control software should be a part of your curriculum. And if it isn't, you are doing your, your students a, a vast disservice. Right? I am tired of getting interns and junior developers and having to teach them this crap. Because like, you will use this every day if you computer. Um, it should be taught in schools. And, and the fact that it isn't is really annoying. Um, all right, back to our definition. So revision control system is just track changes, right? What's distributed mean? What, what is that? It just means spread out across the internet. That's, that's really all it means. So distributed revision control system is really just a fancy CS jargony way of saying track changes spread out across the internet, across multiple people. 
Another brief aside, because really the only reason I give talks is to get a room full of people together and rant at them. Um, Git is not only for code. Git is a really nice fit for any kind of, come on in, dude. It's all good. Yeah, awesome. Um, Git's a really nice fit for any kind of text-based information that changes over time. So that could be uh, a website, that could be some documentation, it could be your resume, it could be your recipe file. Like I keep my recipes in Git because I might change them over time and I want to see what they used to be. Um, it will even work okay with binary formats, like I keep photos in Git too. It's just a little bit harder to see some of the changes. Um, also pet peeve, Git is not GitHub. Right? GitHub is an online service for hosting Git repositories and doing sort of various project managing stuff, but that's not Git. Git underlies that, but GitHub is a whole lot more and we're not going to talk about that. It's also not GitLab. GitLab is a different repository hosting site. All, uh, it's not Bitbucket, um, it's not SourceForge, it's not whatever the flavor of the week is. All of these things are just sites that provide hosting for Git-based projects, but if you learn the basics of Git, um, the material in this talk will apply to any of those services. It applies to GitHub, it applies to GitLab, Bitbucket, whatever. Um, if you focus on just learning the basics of Git at first, then it doesn't matter what Git hosting site you eventually end up using or your work ends up using and you're forced to use. Um, so when you start using Git, one of the first things you have to do if you don't already have it is get it installed. Um, and you can get this from this site that is intuitively named git-scm.com. That stands for source code management, if that helps you remember it at, at all. Um, I will put these slides up online, so don't feel the need to like try to copy down these URLs. Um, if you go to git-scm.com, you will see this site, and they do a nice job of sort of sniffing what platform you're on and providing you a download link um, that will allow you to uh, get git installed. You may also see down here, if you're observant, that they have this link for GUIs. Um, this is a good time to talk about GUI Git versus CLI Git. It also would be a good time to lighten up my photos because my dog is apparently just too dark to show up. If we turn off, if we, oh, I, I actually lights. turned off <laughs> most of the lights and I'm afraid if I turn off the lights and back, people right. will go to sleep and that is a blow that my ego can't stand right now. Um, so after, after thinking about this for a bit, uh, when I was developing this talk, I decided to, to give all the examples in the talk in terms of Git's command line interface. Um, that was for a couple of reasons. One, if you're using Git, eventually you're going to run into something that you don't know how to do and you're going to need help and you're going to go out on the internet and do a search for it and all of the examples that you're going to find and all of the answers you're going to find are going to be in terms of the command line interface. So if you're not familiar with the command line interface at that point, you will be technically what we call screwed. Um, so you need to have some familiarity with the command line interface. There are also a whole bunch of different GUIs, um, and by not talking about any of them, I avoided having to learn any of them and develop opinions on which ones are better than others. And if nothing else, I am fundamentally lazy. So uh, if you're not familiar with the command line, uh, someone named uh, Tracy Osborne, who's written a couple of really nice books about introductory web design and web development, recently put out this free uh, online ebook called Really, Fremin really Friendly Command Line Intro. Um, and it's available for download at hellowebbooks.com slash learn-command-line. And again, I'll put the slides up. You don't have to <laughs> worry about copying down those URLs. Um, so if you're not familiar with the command line, this is a really good way to sort of get your feet wet initially. Um, before we can do anything else with Git, we need to tell Git who we are. Um, and I will explain why this is important later, but you need to run these two commands. Um, git config dash dash global user dot name and then your name, and git config dash dash global user dot email and your email address. Um, git config is a command for modifying the configuration of Git. In this case, we're using this dash dash global flag to tell Git, hey, I want to make these changes for everything I do with Git. I want this to affect Git universally on this machine. Um, the information is needed because once we start making changes in a few slides, Git is going to track who made what change and when. So you need to tell it who it is because if you don't, 
it will guess, and Git is kind of stupid and it will guess wrong in 99% of the cases. And if it actually, if it can't guess, it will refuse to work, which, so it's stupid and obstinate, which is gonna kind of be a theme. Um, so now that you've set up Git and you, you've told it who you are, you need to get a repository to work on. Okay, so here's some jargon, repository, and I said this earlier, and I didn't explain it. I'm really gonna try hard to break down all of the jargon in this talk and sort of define all of these words that aren't used in normal English. So a repository is just Git for a project or a directory where the contents are controlled by Git. You'll also hear people say repo instead of repository because repository has like 27 syllables and it gets really annoying to say after a while. Um, the first way you can get a Git repo is you can clone it. That's another piece of jargon. Clone is Git speak for making a copy of somebody else's repository. This is typically what you'll do if you're contributing to an open source project. You'll go out and find where the repository is on GitHub or GitLab or somebody's website, and you'll clone it to your local machine, and then possibly make changes to it and contribute it back to the project. So this is a, a GitHub site for actually a piece of, of open source software that I maintain called Git Wrapper. It's a Perl module. Uh, for interacting with Git. And if you click this green button here, which says clone or download, it will pop up this little box, and this is the URL that you need to clone the repository. So you would copy that, and conveniently, that little button right there, which is a clipboard icon, if you copy that, it will, if you click that, it will copy the URL for you, and then you can go to the command line and type git clone and paste that URL in, and it will clone the repository for you. And if you run that, it looks like this. It prints, it says cloning into git wrapper, so it's gonna make a directory called git dash wrapper and put a bunch of stuff in it. This is all stats about how long it took and how big it was and you can ignore all of it because it doesn't matter. Um, the second option for getting a repository is you can make your own, you do it yourself. And you do that with a command called git init. You say git init and then give your project a name and it will look like this. It will say initialized empty git repository, and I, and I said git init my new project, and it put that in the, the current directory I happen to be in, which is my home directory. And if you look inside that my new project directory, what you will see is it, there's nothing there. There's one directory called .git, and that's it. If you look inside .git, you will see a whole bunch of stuff that you can completely ignore. That's where git keeps all of its data and information, and if you ever have a Git repository that you want to not be a Git repository anymore, you can delete that .git directory and bam, it won't be a Git repository anymore. Yes, sir? You said that. Um, the, the previous command to get a repository is already built when I'm cloning my local repository. I want to be in the location before I execute the command so that it builds my local repository where I am as opposed to being at root and doing a Git not, so you didn't give me any place to tell it where to build my local repository. Yes, it, it pretty much yeah, uh, all, all, all. a, a, current, a, a project that's already up there, where do I tell it to build my local repository? Because that's what I'm doing here, right? You're checking out, you're, you're making a copy of this repository that's at this URL, and yeah, it'll, it'll go into whatever your current working directory is. Right. Okay. That's yeah, generally Git commands will work on the current working directory. Okay. Um, okay, so now we have a repo, um, and let's continue pretending that we're working in this my new project uh, repository for a little bit. Let's add a file to this repository. Let's add a readme file. Um, so typically an open source project will have a file at the root level uh, of the repository, the, the, the top level of the repository, called readme or readme.md because it's in a file format called markdown. Um, and it'll tell you some introductory material about the project, like what problem it's trying to solve, possibly how to build the software, and maybe how to contribute to the project. So let's make that file. Um, so I'm an Emacs user. I'm not ashamed. Um, <laughs> let's pretend we open up Emacs and, and we put some basic stuff in the readme file and save it. And now we need to ask Git, hey, Git, what's up? Um, and the way you do that is by running a command called git status. This would be a much better command if it was actually called git sup, um, but it's not. Um, so if we run git status, it'll tell us some stuff that we can ignore and then say, hey, there's this untracked file that I don't know about called readme.md. 
just letting you know, hey, I see this file. You haven't told me about it. I'm, I'm kind of ignoring it. Um, and it also will help me tell you if, if you want me to pay attention to this file, you need to run git add and then the file name. So let's do that. Git add readme.md. And then we'll run git status again. And now git status tells us, hey, there's this change that we're going to be committed. It's a new file, and, and this is what it's called. Git add stages changes to be committed. If you read the documentation for git add, this will tell you git add stages changes to be committed. Um, staging, or the staging area, is another piece of git jargon that we need to break down. And git itself sort of hints at this, tells you you can use this command here to unstage the file. Uh, it sort of to break this down, we need to understand the lifestyle or the life cycle of file changes according to Git. So the different states that Git thinks files can be in. So we have files that are untracked. We saw that when we first added, we created a file in the repository. Git was like, "Hey, I don't know what this file is. That's an untracked file." Then we have staged. This is after we run Git add. It's staged. Um, and then finally, we have a state we'll see here in a minute called committed. So git add takes you from untracked to staged. Staged is this kind of area in between untracked and committed. And it allows you to build up over time what's going to be in a commit piece by piece. When you're first starting out using git, this isn't anything you're going to care about. But once you start to sort of get more familiar with git, um, you will appreciate the, the fact that you can build up a commit over time. I have a question about that. OK. If you make a change to the file in between adding it and committing it, what happens? That change will, at that point, be uns not staged. So if you add a line to a file and stage it, at that point, that, that one line addition is ready to be committed. If you make another change to that file after that, it won't be staged. Um, and that's not confusing at all. So. Once we've got something staged, how do we go on and get it to be committed? We use a command called git commit. Uh, git commit is somewhat unique in the git universe in that the command name actually says what the command does, um, unlike many git commands, which actually do something completely different from what the name would indicate. Um, git once commits to have an accompanying uh, commit message. This is another piece of jargon. So anytime you commit something to a Git repository, you have to provide a commit message. And the commit message is intended to describe what's going on in the commit, probably why the change was made. Um, and this is the point where your name and email address come into play. Because this is the point where Git's going to record, like, oh, hey, Bob did this. And this is Bob's email. Um, by default, the command line Git client uses Vim to write commit messages. Um, if you're not a Vim user, this is probably not what you want. It's going to be very frustrating because you'll be stuck in Vim and you're not going to know how to get out of it. Um, I recently saw, I think, like how to exit Vim is like one of the most popular Stack Overflow questions of all time, which is just insane. Emacs, in its defense, tells you on the startup screen how to exit Emacs. Um, Instead of just saying git commit, you can say git commit dash m for message, and then provide a commit message on the command line, and it won't open Vim, which is generally considered to be a superior uh, behavior. So to review, git add takes files from untracked to staged, and then git commit takes files from staged to committed. OK, so now I know this works without all versioning, but I'm going to ask, why did they make it two steps? Um, they made it two steps because um, frequently when you're making a commit, you may have changes that you don't actually want to commit. You may have outstanding changes in the repository. So for example, you may be trying to fix a bug and you've gone in and added in some additional debugging code, like maybe you know printf, hey, I got here, printf, hey, I got there. You don't want to commit that. So by letting you stage the commit, you can sort of build up and, and decide, hey, I'm going to commit this line, not this line. Um, 
it, it's actually one of the more innovative things that Git has done. It's confusing as hell, but it's actually really useful once you get used to it. So if you stage something, yes, you make changes, and then you stage that. Is that going to be two separate stages, or will the no second whatever stage is overwrite the first one? No, the 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 staging area is cumulative okay. over time. So you can, you can stage one thing, and then stage a second thing, and then stage a third thing, commit all of that, and then come back and stage more stuff for an additional commit. All right, so we've, we've covered adding a file to the repository. What if we need to make a change to a file that's already in the repository? So if we go back to Emacs, and we edit our readme file, and we run git status again. Git status will now tell us, oh hey, this file has been modified. It's not staged yet. We can use git add to change it. We can use git checkout to revert it. So we need to go back to our life cycle of file changes and add an additional step, which is modified, which is, hey, git knows about this file. You've changed it. It knows you've changed it. Can we ask it, hey, what did we do to this file to, to make this change? Yes, we can. That command is called git diff. This will show you the difference between what's in the file right now and what git thinks is in the file. So if you run this, we'll tell you a bunch of stuff that you can ignore. Um, and it shows files, sorry for the people in the back, this is all the way down at the bottom of the screen. File, lines that have been added are shown with pluses. If there had been lines that were deleted, they would be shown with minuses. So looking at this diff, you can tell I originally made a file and I just put in a header called my awesome new project. And then I later came back and added these two lines, a fix me comment saying to write the readme. So this is the difference between the staged file and the committed file? This is the difference between the committed file and the file that is currently on disk. This has nothing to do with the staging area right now. This is just what's in the repository and what's currently on the hard drive. Um, after that, uh, aside from git diff, Adding and editing files is really not that different in Git. Um, to get the changes, to get those two lines that I added to the readme committed, you're going to do the exact same steps as you did when you're adding a file for the first time. You're going to use git add to stage it, and then you're going to use git commit to commit it. So we, you git add, git commit with a commit message so we don't open vim. So what's going on with those commit messages? Where do those go? Um, Git records the commit messages and lets you look at them later. This is called the history of the repository. When you're first getting involved with an open source project, it's worth taking some time after you clone the repository to just read the history of the repo. Like, uh, look at the most recent couple of months worth of commits. This will tell you where the activity in the repository is, which files are being worked on, which files have been very stable and haven't been changed for a while. And you can see, because Git tracks you know, with your email and your name, you can see who's made the changes. You can tell who's actually doing the work in the project as opposed to you know, who's active on the mailing list. The command you use uh, to, to look at that history is called git log. And if you run it, it ends up looking like this. So run git log, we can see it's showing the changes in reverse chronological order. So the newest stuff is on top update the readme with the VIXME, and this was the initial commit where we added the readme. And if we run git log with this uh, flag dash p, which stands for patch, it will actually show you a diff for each change. So here we can see that's the same git diff that we saw before. This is the original. You can tell that the file's being added because it's being compared to dev null, and we just added that one line. So a few more concepts um, to go through. Git has this notion of branches. God, I need to just go in and lighten all of my photos. A branch is just a new working copy or repository. So if we go back to the, the track changes analogy that I started out with, this is, is Git branching. You start out, you know, if you're collaborating with somebody in a Word file, you have document.x, and then a couple of days later, you're going to have document final final v2. Um, this is a branch. You just make a new copy of it to put your changes in. Um, the point of branches is they allow you to make changes to your repository without altering that underlying master copy. It's basically a save point. You can get back to the point where you started from. 
The way you make a branch is with a command called checkout. Checkout also allows you to switch between branches. But if you're creating a branch, you have to use, oops, you have to use this dash B command. So get checkout dash B and then the name of your new branch. At that point, you will have made the branch, you make your changes in the branch, you, you commit your branch, and in order to share your branch with other people, you're going to do something called push. Um, it's not this kind of push. Pushing means sending the changes from your local repository up to some other copy of the repository. And this is where GitHub or GitLab or Bitbucket or your, your works Git server may come into play. You're going to push to that other server. And you just use a command called git push. Git push by default will uh, push your current branch up to what's called the remote, uh, which is the repository you're pushing changes to. You may also at this point need to do a pull request, um, which is just a request to somebody else to saying, hey, I pushed some changes to you. Please pull them into your copy of the repository. Once you say push, you're, you're pointing it to a server. Now, you may be pointing it to a server, yes. How does, how does Git know where to push to? Um, generally, if you have started your repository by making a clone, um, that information comes down with the clone. If you uh, created the repository yourself with the git init command, you need to do what's called adding a remote which is something I don't cover in this talk, but the, the syntax for that is git remote add blah, blah, blah. So that's, that's the difference between using git init and git clone to start out your repository. That is one of the differences, <coughs> yes. Um, is that git clone, because you're starting with a copy of an existing repository, git keeps track of where that originally came from and configures uh, that clone of the repository so that when you push, it goes back to the source. So git clone sets the remote server? Yes, by default. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so generally speaking, if, if you're dealing with an open source project or a work project, when you make a pull request, what that kicks off is a process called code review. So somebody is going to look at your pull request, decide whether or not it's worthy. Um, and then when the work on the branch passes that review step, you or somebody else needs to complete a process called merging. Merging is when you take a branch and integrate it back into the master copy of the repository. And the way you do that is you run git checkout master. So master is sort of the default branch. When you start git, there's always a branch, and the first branch is always called master. Um, Without the dash B command, the git checkout command here just switches branches. So what we're doing here is switch, switching from whatever branch we're on back to the master branch. And then we're going to run the git merge command with the name of the branch we want to merge. And that will merge that branch into the master branch. And then following this, you would probably run git push again to share those changes in the master branch back with the, the main copy of the repository. All right, so that's kind of the, the overview of basic Git stuff. Um, let's talk a little bit about what to do when things go bad. There are two fixes that almost, almost always work uh, when you have a Git repository that you have, uh, the technical term is effed up. Um, there are two things that you can try. So one is to make a copy of the repository just using the, the CP command, right? Or, or in your GUI file manager, just literally copy the entire repository, set it aside, and then take whatever fix you found by searching on the internet and try it on the copy. That way, because generally speaking, in my experience, fixes for get stuff on the internet work about 47% of the time. And when they don't work, they are going to make things worse. So you want to preserve your initial screwed up state before you possibly make it worse. Now when you say make a copy, are you talking about just like um, 
Linux command yeah. line. Yeah, yeah, like literally just CP dash R. Yeah. Um, <laughs> make a copy of the entire directory of your Git repository. And then try whatever the fix you found is on the copy. And if it works on the copy, then do it on the original. If it doesn't work on the copy, delete the copy. Make another copy. Try the second Google link. Um, the second thing you can do is just rename your repository. I, I like to use .bad as, a, as an extension. And then just make a new clone of wherever you got it from. And then if there are any changes in the repository that haven't been committed yet, then copy them from the bad copy into the new copy. This will fix everything. It's not necessarily the most satisfying thing. Um, I, I will also say that uh, I'm a fairly sophisticated Git user. I've been using it for over 10 years. Um, I've given multiple conference talks on various aspects of Git. I've led training uh, sessions on Git. And I've managed to screw things up in a repository so badly that I've done this like twice in the last year. Because I probably could have fixed it, but I didn't feel like spending like a couple of hours figuring out how to fix it. So there is no shame in doing this. Um, all right, to review, we, we've covered a lot of ground. We've scaled mountains here today. Um, Git status is how you ask Git, hey, what's going on in this repository? Git add is how you take a file that you've just added to the repository or changes you've made to a file in the repository and move them into the staging area. And then git commit is how you take changes that are in that staging area and actually commit them into the repository. Git diff is how you ask git, hey, what has changed in this file on disk relative to what's in the repository? Git log is how you get get to show you what's happened in the repository over time, historically, what changes were made and by whom. Git branch is how you uh, make a new branch. Git checkout is how you actually uh, switch to that branch. Git push is how you share your changes out to another copy of your repository somewhere else that's called the remote. Git merge is how you take changes that are on a branch and bring them back into another branch. And that was all the Git commands that we went over. So a few additional resources that are helpful. Um, damn, every photo I have is just like too dark. This is a picture of beer. Um, <laughs> beer is a helpful additional resource when you're working with Git <laughs> many times. Um, Git-scm is the uh, .com is the official Git uh, website. This is where you would get Git if you don't have it. Uh, hello webbooks.com slash learn command line is where that uh, really friendly command line intro can be found. Uh, GitHub has a really nice uh, learning site for Git called try.github.io that gives you a little uh, console in a web browser and a sort of walks you through an interactive learning session with Git. Basically teaches you how to actually use all of the commands that I talked about in this talk. Um, so if you're more of a learn by doing type person, this is a great place to, to start. Also on the git-scm site at slash book, uh, there is an online copy of a book called Pro Git, um, which if you get to the point where you decide like, hey, I want to know a whole lot about Git, including all the nitty gritty details of how it actually works under the hood, that book is a great place to start. Uh, and I just want to wrap up by saying thanks. Uh, thanks to the organizers for accepting this talk. Thanks to all of you for showing up to the talk, particularly first, uh, first talk of the day. Uh, I want to thank my employer, uh, Infinity Interactive, uh, for basically paying for me to be here. Um, and also, this is a good time to say, since we do have some students, if anybody is still looking for an internship for the summer, um, we're accepting internship applications uh, up until Monday, actually. So if you're interested, hurry. Um, and then finally, I'm happy to take questions. Yes, sir, in the blue hat. So if I have a file, I save the file, and then I edit the heck out of the file, and commit the file, I'm going to lose all those edits. If you, so the, the question was, if you make some changes to a file, and then stage those changes, and then make additional changes, and then commit, uh, will you lose the second set of changes? No. They won't be committed. They will still be shown up as unstaged, modified changes.
The only thing that will be committed is the stuff that you have staged, but the additional round of changes won't be lost. And then I could R in a letter to uncommit. Then you could, the, 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 you could, um, you could revert, uh, if you don't want those changes that you have not staged, yes, you could revert them. The command to do that is, in a completely intuitive uh, command, git checkout dash dash file name. Yeah, and it's dash dash space file name, not <laughs> dash dash file name without. Um, that, that is actually, so git is, is my poster child for my theory that programmers should not design user interfaces for normal people. Um, <laughs> it is really horrible. Um, uh, it, 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 you could you could blame Linus, but um, he's not actually. He hasn't been the primary maintainer of Git for several years. Um, I, I prefer to blame all of us at this point. Like it's <laughs> atrocious. Um, there was another. Yes, sir. Does it have any integrated merge tools? Does it have any integrated merge tools? Merge tools. I mean, merging is one of the points where you have a discussion with your peers. Or the maintainer? Um, and no. Okay. So, does Git have any integrated merge tools or anything that makes code review uh, sort of easier? No, it has nothing. Um, that's actually one of the places, one of the sort of niches that GitHub and GitLab uh, and Bitbucket uh, and Garrett uh, and probably seventeen other tools that I'm not thinking of kind of fill is providing a way to. Uh, provide feedback on a merge, on a pull request, a potential merge, um, but Git out of the box has nothing. In the back? Uh, for the internship, what should you look for? For the internship, what are we looking for? Um, it's actually, if you go to that URL, it'll tell you what we're looking for. Um, we are, uh, because you opened the door and gave me the opportunity, <laughs> <laughs> we're, uh, um, Small company, we do custom software development, uh, web development. Um, we are 100% remote. Um, and really, we're not looking for any particular set of skills as much as we're looking for attitude and aptitude. Perfect. Other questions? I got a few more minutes. Yes, sir. You know, R RCS had an automatic uh, revision bump when you do the equivalent of a commit. And I've read about it in Git. Right, so basically what does Git provide in the way of, of version tracking? Is, is that your question? Um, so unlike RCS, um, the way Git actually, and, and forgive me, we're gonna, this like just took a, a dramatic left turn from introductory crap to like opening up the hood and ripping out the engine. Um, the way Git actually works under the hood is it's not tracking changes to the files as much as every time you do a commit, it's basically taking a snapshot of the entire repository and saving that. So there's not like, the, the it's just fundamentally different from the way RCS worked. And there's no like, every commit has uh, an identifier. Um, let me. So every commit has what's called a, a SHA, or SHA-1, which is this big long string of gobbledygook right here. That uniquely identifies that commit in that repository, and it's based on uh, a combination of the contents of the commit message, the time the commit is made, who made the commit, and the diff between the current change and the previous revision. Um, so that uniquely identifies that commit and always lets you get back to that commit. That's the basically the equivalent to the RCS revi revision number, but it, RCS was also linear, and Git doesn't have to be linear because of the branching. Um, so they're just, I understand, I think, what you're trying to ask, but it's like apples and oranges. They're just fundamentally different conceptually. So if that's the case, how does Git keep from bloating hugely? 
How does Git keep from bloating hugely? Because it's, it's what, it, every commit takes a snapshot of the entire repository? So Conceptually sorry. and effectively, yes. Practically, no. We typically have a trunk, which is the released version. And branches are experiments. And we may merge those deltas into the trunk sure. and release that. Or we may just throw a branch away because it's just a cluster mess. Um, so I mean, when, when, you, when you say they're all branches, yes, technically they're all branches, but only one of those is going to be the one which we are going to bless and release. Um, was there a question in that, or was that just a <laughs> statement? <laughs> Okay, so that the the what you just said about uh, there there is a trunk and that trunk is the released version and branches may be experiments. That is a way to do software development, but that is not necessarily the way that you have to do software development. There is nothing at all in Git that requires you to have a release branch, a trunk, or a definitive uh, source of truth. It is a distributed revision control system, which means that you can use it in a way where th there may not be a central location where changes go back to. Um, if you look at how kernel development is done, different sections of the kernel are effectively owned by people that are called lieutenants. Um, and lieutenants maintain their own branches. And there are people who run the software in that branch as the release version. And, and changes move back and forth in the form of patches. It's a very uh, messy way of doing development. It's not a way that most companies would do development. Like most of the time, if you're working in a company or a small open source project, yes, there's going to be a repository that is the, the origin and the source of truth, and changes will flow back to that repository. But that doesn't, there's nothing that requires it to be that way. Yes, sir. So you're working on a development branch and your user who's using two releases ago calls up with a problem that you didn't know about and you want to do a quick fix, but you don't know what other customers might have the same problem. So now, what are you going to do, copy the whole thing over, or can you just go back and pull a prior release? How would you make a hot fix to a previous released yeah. version of your software? Um, hopefully... It, Git has uh, a thing that I didn't talk about in the talk called tags, which allows you to basically uh, give a name to a particular commit that's a lot more convenient than that SHA-1 gobbledygook string. So generally, when you do a release of your software, you tag the commit that corresponds to that release so that you can go back to that release. So what you would do in that case is check out the commit that corresponds to the release software, make a new branch from that point, put your hotfix on the branch, roll it on out. And, and how you roll it out is going to depend on your release process and you know whether you're doing a custom fix for that user or whether you need to get the fix back into your main line. All right. Thanks, folks. I'm around all weekend if anybody has something they didn't want to ask in public. Thank you.